Hi, welcome to iTech Training's COT Prep Course with Sharon Alamohodei. I'm Sharon. Let's get started. There'll be different points during the course that you'll see a yellow starburst in the upper left corner. This tells you that there's additional information about this topic in your handouts. So make sure that you print all your handouts and review them during the course when you see one of those stars in the upper corner. There are about 200 questions on the exam. You can count on about 6% of the questions as being from the history taking section. That means that you should expect about 12 questions on history taking. The chief complaint is the main reason that the patient came in. It might be follow-up of a previously diagnosed condition, or it might be for a new complaint. This should be brief, in one or two sentences, and in the patient's own words. The history of present illness is the detail regarding the chief complaint using the descriptives that are listed here. A sign is something objective that you can actually see on the patient. A symptom is something subjective that you can't see on the patient, but the patient experiences. The review of systems is an inventory of the body systems. These are not diseases themselves. These are the organ systems that their presenting complaints affect. For instance, if they're presenting for a diabetic eye exam, you would check endocrine disorder. The PFSH is the past and present health conditions and their family and social history. That's self-explanatory. Find out who's treating them for their major systemic conditions. Now, I'm not talking about chronic things that they've had for years and years. I'm talking about, for instance, if they've had a stroke recently or a heart attack or they're being treated for cancer, some major systemic disease that's actively being treated. You want to find out who their doctor is because we may need to get a report to that doctor or if they're having surgery, we may need to request medical clearance. If they're diabetic, ask the patient how long they've been diabetic. This is important because diabetes typically won't cause retinopathy until the patient's been diabetic 10 to 15 years. We have to take this with a grain of salt, of course, because many patients are not diagnosed immediately, so they may have diabetes for many years before they're diagnosed. Find out their last blood sugar and whether it was sta it's been stable or unstable. The reason we want to ask this is because as the blood sugar fluctuates, the crystalline lens in the eye can actually become edematous when the blood sugar rises, so their refractive error can fluctuate with their blood sugars. It's very important to find out if their blood sugars have been stable or unstable because it helps your doctor to put their visual acuity and their refractive error in context. If their blood sugar is unstable, ask them in the last two weeks what was your highest and lowest, and then record that. Some doctors want the A1C recorded. This is a percentage of glucose in their blood over a period of three months, and it gives an idea for long-term control of their blood sugar. Because it's expressed as a percentage, the number won't correlate to their blood sugar. So for instance, a blood sugar might be 150 or 210, whereas an A1C might be 5.8 or 6.3. Stereo vision is a high quality of vision that gives you three dimensionality. If you're missing any one of these three things, you won't have stereo vision. You must have good vision in both eyes. The maculas must be projected straight ahead and you need to have overlapping visual fields. Monocular patients can have depth perception, but they do not have stereo vision. There are six cardinal positions of gaze. Up and right, right, down and right, up and left, left, down and left. The reason that we call these the six cardinal positions of gaze is because when our patient looks in these six gaze movements, every single extraocular muscle in each eye must work at some point in time. So it's a way to evaluate the functioning of the patient's extraocular muscles. Ductions are monocular movements. Actually, both eyes really are moving, but we are occluding one eye and we're only looking at the actions of the uncovered eye. So let's see some ductions here. I'm going to cover his left eye. 
So if he looks to his right, he is abducting his right eye. He is moving his right eye away from his nose, abducting, abducting. If he looks to his left, he is ad, ADD, ducting his right eye. If he looks up, that is superduction. And if he looks down, that is infraduction. So ductions are monocular movements involving only one eye. So now we're going to check versions. Remember that if your patient can look in all six cardinal positions of gaze with both eyes, that means that all of their extraocular muscles in both eyes are working. We want to check and see if both eyes move smoothly and in unison in all six cardinal positions of gaze. So I have a pen and I'm going to have my patient look at the tip of my pen. So I want you to look right here. And I'm going to move my pen, but I want you to just follow it with your eyes and don't move your head. It doesn't really matter what pattern you make when you're doing this, just so long as you have your patient look in all of those six cardinal positions of gaze. So his versions look full. His eyes move smoothly and in unison in all six cardinal positions of gaze. So we're good. Vergences are movements of both eyes in the opposite direction. So when my patient is looking at a close-up target, he is converging. Both eyes are moving towards one another. And when he then looks in the distance, his eyes have to diverge to get there. So here is convergence and divergence. One way to measure light intensity is with foot candles. One foot candle of light is the amount of light that one candle generates from one foot away from a surface. And that is equivalent to one lumens. Let's say you have a lamp. You're told that it produces 100 foot candles of light. That means at one foot from the lamp, you will receive 100 foot candles of light or 100 lumens. Now, hang with me here because this is going to get a little tricky. The further away you move the light from what you want to illuminate, the less bright the light seems. If you measure the amount of light intensity right at the light, it's just as bright, but when you measure at the object that you want to have illuminated, it's less light the farther away you are from that object. So the light that's measured on an object is inversely proportional to the distance the object is from the light source. That's a way of saying that the closer you are to the light bulb, the brighter the bulb is. Or think of it this way. You can't change how much light comes out of your light bulb. So to make more light on an object, you have to either move the light closer or add more light. Snell's Law is a physics principle that describes optics and the relationship between the angles of incidence and the angles of refraction when referring to light that passes through a boundary between two different media, such as water, glass, or air. In optics, Snell's Law is used to compute the angles of incidence or angles of refraction and to find the refractive index of a given material. Here we have a glass of water to demonstrate this optics principle. We have what's called the normal line. This is a theoretical line that's placed perpendicular to the interface between the two substances, air and water. We simply use this line to measure angles from. Our straw as it enters the water is our incident ray. The straw that's in the water is our refracted ray. So when light passes from air into water, the ray of light is refracted or bent. Notice that the refracted ray is bent toward the normal line. Our angle of incidence is a measurement of the angle between the incident ray and the normal line. 
our angle of refraction is a measurement of the angle between the refracted ray and the normal line. When light passes from air into water and it is bent towards the normal line, so your angle of incidence is always larger than your angle of refraction. Prism bends light rays towards its base. It also fragments the light into the different colors of the spectrum. If you look closely in the refracted ray, you'll see the colors of the rainbow in order by wavelength. Red has the longest wavelength and violet the shortest. The definition of one diopter is that lens which brings light to a focal point at a distance of one meter. The higher powered the lens, the shorter its focal length, and the lower the power lens, the longer its focal length. A four diopter lens has a very short focal length. A quarter diopter lens has a very long focal length.